brilliant. Thank you very much. Come on up, guys. Come on up. So what we will you and Joanne, Ben, and I'll, yeah, there we go. Brilliant. Okay, so whilst um, <laughs> our panelists take their seats, ladies and gents, I thought I might do something um, different and break with tradition uh, of conferences and how they go. I'm going to ask you for a bit of audience participation in a moment, if that's okay. Um, first and foremost, even though we know that 54% of working days lost in 2018 and 19 is as a result of stress, anxiety, and depression, absence is at an all-time low. So job done. <laughs> Well-being taken care of. Thanks for coming. Uh, safe journey home. Um, everybody up on your feet, please, if you wouldn't mind. I, I wonder if this is actually the case. If you wouldn't mind standing up for me, let's uh, have a go at this. Okay, everybody should be standing if they are able. That would be great. <clears throat> okay, then sit down if your organization does not have a well-being or mental health policy. Wow, so that's a lot of people who do have a policy who have remained standing. Brilliant, thank you very much. Everybody stand up again for me, please. Let's ask the next question. Sit down if you've ever come to work when you knew that you weren't well. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yes, something slightly different. Thank you. And up on your feet again, please, if you wouldn't mind. Last one, promise. It's like doing squats, this, isn't it? It's great. Okay, then. Um, sit down if you've ever worked on holiday or when you've been on the sick. Good to know you've all got policies, though. Brilliant stuff, brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. Have a seat for me. Okay, I wonder if you could help me. <laughs> uh, my name's Terry Strether. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for playing my game. Um, I'm the director of Oka Training, where we help organizations understand their responsibility, uh, responsibilities under well-being and mental health, and how to look after their teams um, better. Let's put it that way. This afternoon's session is a great opportunity, I think, to hear from people who are actually in the trenches, in the front line, so that's about as much you're going to hear from me. Um, they all have different stories, and they're all at different places, so that it just kind of reinforces the message that we've heard throughout the day, that there isn't a one-size-fits-all. Would you please help me in welcoming Ewan Hutton, who's the Chief Nuclear Officer at Sellafield, uh, Joanne Theodulu, have I said that correctly? Oh, we're all practicing in the green room, get in. Uh, General Counsel and Company Secretary at Simply Business. Uh, this is Ben Orcott, um, International Director at the Civil Aviation Authority. And finally, June Clark, who's Market, and Market Health and Wellbeing Manager at Nestle. Um, obviously, we're super excited to get your questions. So I know that some of you are already used to using Slido. Please do fire in the questions. You can do that from now, I believe. So please get those questions coming in. OK, um, I thought I'd kick things off nice and easy with a, a question to all of you, really. Uh, I don't know who's going to jump in here. You and I'll probably come to you first, if that's OK. Talk to us about some of the unique challenges that you face in your workplace. Um, so, um, as Terry said, I'm um, from Sellfield Limited. Uh, we have essentially two main sites, one near Manchester, one in West Cumbria, and we have about 11,000 employees. Um, there's sort of two unique things, and they might not be unique. I do apologize if other people have the same unique thing that we've got, and thereby it is not <laughs> unique. Um, and that is, um, one is that, that our site has been there for so long, it, it has very, very entrenched uh, culture and behaviors. Um, I, I glibly say every now and then that, that we're still in the 1970s, um, and Alf Garnet would actually fit in really quite well, unfortunately. And that's one of our challenges. So how do we, how do we move the mental health agenda on uh, and how do we move the broader EDI agenda on when, when you've got a culture which has been born out of the civil service, out of delivering a national imperative to this point today? So that's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, and it's principally in West Cumbria, um, we employ about uh, 10,000 people in, in West Cumbria uh, and they all know each other outside work. So our, our challenge is that... that, that when you're at work and when you're not at work, the culture kind of pervades all the way through. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do through our uh, mental health improvement journey is recognize that in West Cumbria, and I don't know if any of you have been to West Cumbria, you might have been to the Lake District. So West Cumbria is the bit of the Lake District that you won't go to because it's just on the other side next to the coast. Uh, you'll have heard about Workington Man recently. Some politicians have been talking about that. So Workington is about 20 miles from Sellafield, and then you've got Whitehaven. Um, but um, if, you've never, if you've never been there, uh, you, you won't realize, you won't understand that um, it, is the, uh, it is the place where um, it's the fattest people in the UK. Um, there was a survey that said that. We've got the most um, um, uh, fast food outlets. I think those two things probably go together. 
It's the cheapest place to buy a house in the UK, in, in Copeland, um, and it has the lowest amount of savings. So we have this really interesting uh, culture where it's a, a really cheap, good place to live, but nobody, nobody saves any money. Um, and, and we have, um, as I say, 10,000 of, of the people who live in that community work on our site. So there's a really big challenge for us, which is how can we make the best use of those people in, in, this, in the wider society. So we've, we've trained, as many of you have, we've trained about 200 mental health first aiders, we call them mental health champions. Uh, and what we're recognizing now is that's a resource that can be utilized in the community much more than just on our site, because that's 200 people who live in that community who work with sports clubs, with wow. youth groups, with, with old people and whatever else. Wow. And so it's utilizing uh, that. So that's the unique thing. Fantastic. You and that's a fantastic introduction. Thank you. I'm not going to do the usual thing and go down the line. I'd like to be unpredictable. <laughs> June, can you help us out? What about your workplace? Um, so, so Nestle is a, a global business and we've got about 320,000 employees worldwide. Um, and we grow our own top talent. So we move people around, around the world, around the different markets. So you'll get... Um, so our senior leaders come in from very, very different cultures and backgrounds. Um, so from a very top level, we've got a, quite a diverse culture um, that changes every three to five years. Um, and then we've got similar issues to, to Ewan because we've got factories... So we, in the UK, we've got 8,000 um, employees, and 60% of those are in our manufacturing business. And a factory in Newcastle is very, very different culturally to a factory in Derby. Yeah. And a head office, we've got two big head offices. Our head office in Gatwick is very, very different culturally, again, to our head office in York. Uh -huh. So creating a strategy where you can't have a one-size-fits-all because we don't have a one-size-fits-all community. That, that's the biggest challenge, is how do, you, how do you make sure what we create from a market level is, is going to work for everybody? Brilliant. Thank you, Joanne. And, and that diverse workforce is something that perhaps you might comment as, on as well, mm -hmm. Joanne, where you work. Yeah, that's right. So Simply Business is uh, an insurance provider. We're an online insurance provider for micro SMEs, so most of our customers are really very small. Few of them have employees, um, and there's about half a million of them. Um, but we're, we're a relatively small company. Well, compared to these guys, we're, mm. we're tiny. Yeah. Um, we've got about 700 employees in the UK, split between a London office and a customer contact center in Northampton. Um, and I suppose... But, you know, again, culturally, there's quite a difference between those two offices. Um, the people on the phones in Northampton uh, tend to be from that area. They, many of them are from the town itself. Um, their salaries are lower. Um, it's a slightly lower skilled work, although if you hear them on the phones, they're actually incredible um, at, at what they do. I, I find it amazing. Um, but... London is it's a bit more of a diverse workforce. We've got people from, from all over the place and, and, a, and a much wider range of, of jobs as well, um, right. as well there. Fab, so hopefully things resonating with audience members, uh, I would hope anyway. What about yourself, Ben? Yeah, this is where I, I come in at the end and realise that everything I've got to say about being unique isn't really unique because everybody's <laughs> already said it before. Um, so we're the Civil Aviation Authority. We're 1,200-ish people. Um, regulating most aspects of aviation in the UK, safe, but mainly safety, security, and uh, for consumer protection. So we also run the Atoll Scheme, for those of you that have taken those sort of Atoll protected holidays. Um, we're very much an organisation of microcultures because we draw our main regulatory workforce from the industry that we regulate. So, and they tend to come with very strong cultures around their profession. So our pilot community... Um, our air traffic control community, our engineer community, bring those cultures with them. They, they often come to us uh, second or third career. So that's very quite strongly embedded before they arrive. Yeah. Um, our economists, similarly, um, who look after the economic regulation. And the, but then we do have a strata that we recruit from the local community, um, who, for example, run our, uh, our licensing team and work in our licensing team. They're, they're managing 60,000 stakeholders. Um, pilots, engineers, and uh, traffic controllers around the UK. Quite a transactional basis, but also having to take enforcement action from time to time. So right. 
And so we, we touch every part of the industry, not that many people, but very, lots of very small microcultures, which has, quite, uh, has its own impact on how you then change culture in the organisation. Brilliant. So with all those challenges that you face on a day-to-day -day basis, then how, how are you able, because I know that you're the key drivers in this whole thing, aren't you? So how are you able to make sure that this well-being mental health piece stays on the agenda of senior business leaders? Who wants to jump in with that one first? Uh, I suppose, well, the first thing I would say is just you've got to keep talking about it. So that's the first thing. If you're not communicating about it, then it's not on anybody's agenda. Um, from our point of view, I suppose we, we've gone for a model where, where um, uh, as an Exco member, I champion it on behalf of the Exco. So it's my job, I think, to keep it on the agenda for the rest of our executive committee. Right. Um, in the audience today is uh, Leo, I don't know where he is, he might put his hand up there, he is. Uh, who is uh, our wellbeing manager. He works in our HR team. So we have that, that link between someone who's sort of a, a frontline leader in the business with the professionals in HR. Um, and through that, through that, firstly through that, that link, but also by having uh, a really clear strategy and then delivering on that strategy, reporting on that strategy, communicating on that strategy. All those things you would do in a change program if you want buy into anything, yeah. we're doing the same thing. It's a different topic. We're not changing location. We're not changing the desks. We're not you know, doing any of those other things you might do as all restructuring. But, but actually the techniques we're using are those you would use in any big change program. And that's quite different for you, isn't it, June? Yeah, because we're a very matrixed environment, <clears throat> what, what, what I've tried to do is try to weave it in through everything we do. So in the team that I work in, I work with the inclusion and belonging manager. I work with the leadership and development manager. I work with the talent manager. Um, and that's worked really, and the learning development manager. Um, and that's worked really, really well because as a team, we weave all our work through the different strategies that are happening. And that's been really, really powerful. So rather than the inclusion and belonging manager doing one thing, you know, she remembers to say to me, June, how do you want to weave this in with wellbeing? Um, and we've done, we do the same with the facilities team. So how do, you, how do you make sure when the facilities team are creating a new workplace that they, they talk to me or you know, talk to people about how do you make it a really engaging place to work? So people aren't working on their own in silos. Um, and, and really getting the um, communication team on board, you know, so that you, when you do do something, you communicate it out really, really well. And that's the hardest thing, is getting employees to recognise, you know, all these great things that you're doing are all, all around their employee wellbeing. Mm. What about where you work, John? How, how are you keeping yeah. this on the agenda of senior leaders? Well, in a number of ways. I mean, a bit, a bit like you, I sit on the exec team, so I have a voice there. I'm kind of mental health champion there. As company secretary, I'm, I'm also in the boardroom. Um, but the other thing at Simply Business to note is that we are a B Corp, um, stands for Benefit Corporation, if you uh, don't know. <coughs> um, and that is something that we commit, and um, to get that accreditation, we sort of commit to, be, to being, um, you know, sort of an excellent workplace, but with our customers and our people in mind specifically, not just our shareholder, but uh, our customers, our people, and, and society at large. And under that sort of people agenda, I think um, sort of mental health and well-being sit very comfortably in, in there. And it really is something that when we're looking at you know, any, any programs for, for our people, whether they're development programs, management programs, um, training that, that people are having, um, changes to our office space, um, all of those things, as you say, some, a lot of that is it's, it's kind of woven in. What is this going to mean for, mm. for people's well-being? Um, are we thinking about that? Is it is it is it um, is it going to make people sort of is, is is work going to be a happy and comfortable place to come to? Yeah, every day. So just having the policy, perhaps not enough, and we see this time and time again yeah. where there's a policy in place. But actually, the nature of that policy actually makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to support good well-being in the workplace. What about yourself, Ian? So, um, um, my job title is Chief Nuclear Officer. Wow. Yeah, I know. Sounds <laughs> cool, doesn't it? <laughs> boom. So it keeps me awake at night. No, wait. Boom. Um, wrong word. Hang on. Um, I'm, I'm principally, what I'm there to do is to make sure, and you'll be really pleased to hear this, that, that, that we keep nuclear safety and security as our, as our absolute priority. Um, so, as part of the executive team, as also the executive sponsor for, for our mental health improvement journey, um, it's, it's really clear and obvious to me that people's mental health is so important to us delivering our mission of maintaining nuclear safety and security as number one priority. You can imagine uh, we do some relatively um, challenging activities 
um, whereby people might wear an awful lot of protective equipment. So we used to always ask people if they physically felt well enough um, to wear that equipment and do strenuous activities. So, so just turning that round slightly and then also asking them, and how do you feel today? Um, um, to make sure that they're on the ball, uh, they're focused on what they're doing such that we can maintain nuclear safety and security uh, at that top level. And the other thing I would just add to that though is um, it is so easy from a senior leadership uh, point of view to drop the ball. Mm -hmm. So recently we had uh, mental health um, Mental Health Week, I think it was. It was Mental yeah, Health Day, worst, sorry. Mental health day. So, so, we, so we did lots of stuff, as you do. And a bit of the feedback I got from one of our mental health champions was two members of the exec just walked past the stand in the foyer and didn't even say hello. And you just think, oh, and it would have been so easy not to do that. So maintaining that simple focus yeah. with the people that aren't thinking about it all the time because yeah. they've got other really important things to be thinking about, it's so easy just to, to drop the ball. Absolutely. This, this question, thank you very much for that, Yona. It kind of links to what we're talking about here when we're talking about keeping it on the agenda of leaders. There's a question from Charlie who's come in on the slide. Oh, thank you, Charlie, wherever you are. Have you made leaders really accountable? How do you deal with leaders getting business results but not engaging or supporting employee wellness? Mm -hmm. Who wants to jump in with that? I'll jump in with that. Um, I mean, we don't have specific, let's say, I, there's another question about KPIs for leaders yeah. around how they treat their people. We don't have those at Simply Business. Um, I, I feel that it, it really is ingrained in our, it really is ingrained in our culture. I mean, it, sound, it sounds a bit trite, but, you know, getting, getting results at the cost of people's well-being is just not, it's just not what we do, uh -huh. um, and and I think it does it does permeate throughout throughout the whole organisation. I'm trying to I'm trying to think about sort of how how it how it happens, um, and I, 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 it, it does start from you know from the whole recruitment process. It's the people you get through the door, it's the training, the induction they get, it's what they see around them every day in the office, how people treat each other, how they talk to each other. Um, it's also the programs um, that we put on, and, and, and like you said, we, we also have programs. We've just come to the end of a, uh, a well-being week, which, which, was a, which was a great success, all sorts of different um, events and, and, and so on put on there. But I would say nearly everyone found something during that week that they were interested in and went to, and then they talk about it. And I mean, I mean, perhaps that's also the benefit of being in a much smaller company is that things spread by word of mouth. You see people in the office, you see how they behave, you see how they model um, that, that, that sort of right behavior. Right, so it's the day-to-day -day interactions <laughs> that matter more. Um, in where you work. Um, ben, I can see you looking at me as if I, I want to speak. So what about this point about <laughs> well, leaders and capitalists? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting one. So, I mean, for me, it's about setting my own objectives and getting agreement with my boss, our CEO, about what my objectives about well-being are going to be. Um, train all your leaders and managers so now you have a benchmark for their behaviour and expectation that you can go back to. Otherwise, what, otherwise what, what, what standard are you holding them to? I think the other thing we do, or we've done, or Leo and I have done together about keeping the senior leadership accountable is do write the strategy, get them to sign it off at Exco and board level, deliver on it, show them the KPIs, and get them to buy off on the next one. Because once you've got that, once you've got a bit of a drumbeat around that, 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 that the executive committee and the board have said yes to something, you've got something to go back to. You've, you've got a, a hook to keep going back to them and said, well, you said we were going to do this, this is what we've done, this was the result, now we're now we want to do this next thing. And I think you can start building that momentum just through mm -hmm. repeating that process of buy and deliver new plan, buy and deliver new plan. June, what about you? I know drumbeat is a, is a word that just went ding. Do you know something about drumbeats? You've mentioned yeah, it. Yeah, I think, and I think we, you do have to keep that, that drumbeat going. But I think if you... In a business where you know you you have to you know you have to make results. We you know we make coffee and chocolate and Kit Kats and and water and pet food. And I don't think you can be a really good leader or an authentic leader unless you do believe in that. Because unless you are you know it's the people that produce it for us. You know somebody makes coffee and Kit Kats and pays my wages. And, and I and I do believe that if you've got a really good leadership team. They should know that anyway. Whether they engage in it by, you know, walking past. But I do think, they, I don't think many leaders now can fail to be aware 
of the link between well-being and productivity. Mm -hmm. How they measure it or how they expect to be measured is another thing. But I, I think there's a culture you know, now externally where you can't fail to be um, influenced by the fact that the two are linked together. Yeah, mm -hmm. linked together, yeah. I, I, I think that's really important about that, that, that point about productivity and that link. Although we don't... Measuring regulation is a really difficult thing to do because basically we win if nothing happens. No crashes, nothing, like then, then we've won. Mm. Um, but actually, for a frontline uh, pilot or engineer who's out there on the front line regulating against certain code, uh, it can be quite stressful. You're going into organisations like British Airways, big airlines, big uh, manufacturers. You probably spend two or three days auditing them. And then you're going to spend probably two or three hours in the boardroom telling their CEO all the stuff you want fixed. So it's quite, you know, it's quite, a, quite a pressured environment. And, and if they're not in the right state of mind to do that, then they're not going to do that job well. They won't investigate well, they won't report well, and, and we're not doing what we should be doing on behalf of the public. So training's been mentioned. I'm going to turn to a, a, a question uh, which has just moved. Where's it gone? Oh, there it is, uh, from Darren. Have any of the panel included their programs into the induction of new employees? And is it seen as a positive by those new starters? Mm -hmm. um, just two things. One is I really like Kit Kats. So uh, <laughs> thanks for that. Win-win. Yeah. <laughs> really big, big kick. Peanut butter kick, yeah. You get a discount. So. <laughs> no, I can't, um, sorry. Yeah, we, 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 we're trying to do that. At the moment, in terms of uh, new starters, just with, this, with the, um, the transformation of our business going through, we take on principally apprentices and uh, graduates. Yeah. Um, um, about 250, 300 a year. So the, the discussion this morning about uh, um, uh, the young people's mental health was, was really interesting. And we have, we have tried to introduce it as part of the induction um, and, and to, to, to give them a very um, concise um, uh, piece of work that probably others of you used from uh, Mates in Mind to start the conversation. And that just gets people to talk about it. And then we follow that up at the end of that session just to tell everybody what support network that we've we've built in in the organization and that last bit it is seen as positive we've only started it sort of last year for the, for the intake in the summer so it'll be good to see what sort of impact that has mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anybody else want to come in on that point before but, but we we haven't yet but we will be i think we're, we've just got someone new starting the, in, in the hr team who is going to own the entire induction process and i, and I think it's such an important tool for setting down the cultural markers you want from these from new employees as they join if you're, if you're going to be doing any sort of culture change process then getting as people as they come in when they're most trying to understand how they want how they're going to fit in what it's really like to work here it, it's so important but we haven't quite got there yet but we will we, we'll be doing over the next few months joanne i know yeah. you do quite a bit about that don't you? yeah we do we have um so all new joiners uh, all new joiners go on what we call thrive in five which is a five-day induction program where they get introduced to the whole business uh, our customer base um, they learn about you know how, how we do what we do and, and so on um, and as part of that, they will be introduced to uh, our well-being and, and our mental health offering. Um, it's, it's just a small part of the induction, but it, it's flagged from day one that, you know, we've got mental health first aiders. These are the people you can see um, if you need to talk to somebody. Um, these are the sort of events we put on. Our intranet has a page with all our information and, and, and other things on there. So I think it's, it, it's something that people are conscious of. From, 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 the moment, from the moment they join. So I can see Leo looking daggers at me. We do do that bit. We do, do, we do actually, we do have a... Uh, oh, we oh do, they're fighting everybody. We do have stands at some of the induction marketplaces. But I think there's more we could do. There's more we could do. And we do get some good feedback on some of the blogs we do around mm. mental health from new starters saying, wow, I never thought the CA would do this sort of thing. But Are I, you I cheating think we then? could have build you got more stuff more in. Yeah, yeah, you've got a prompt. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this question from Mark then, I suppose, perhaps linked. Um, hmm. How have you equipped your frontline... Oh, has it got keeps moving? That's distracting. How have you equipped your frontline people leaders to maintain the well-being focus? Training, question mark. Use of internal social media, question mark. Coaching, question mark. Events, question mark, hmm. etc. Likes the use of the question mark. Good use. Then. It's not the appropriate use, I feel, yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there. I mean, I think... Uh, 
as I mentioned before, so people who are going to be managing people for the first time, as an example, they have a, 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 a training program that teaches them how to, some of the sort of more practical sides of, of management, but also a little bit, a little bit about um, how, we like to, how we like to do things and how we like to treat people. That does have um, a module about having difficult conversations with staff, as an example. Mm -hmm. So that might be where someone does have something that they're bringing to work with them, or that is perhaps caused by work that they want to talk about. Because um, we, we talk a lot about raising awareness and making an environment that's, that's sort of com comfortable for people to come forward. But you then need your managers and, and your leaders to be equipped to have those conversations. Um, you, you, a lot of people are sort of slightly afraid, perhaps, to lift the lid on something to know how someone really is in case they don't really know what to do with the information when they get it. Mm. Um, so whilst you're not training people to be you know, counsellors or psychotherapists or actually, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it is, it's a sort of, you know, how to have those conversations sensitively and how to signpost. Um, um, yeah, uh, internal social media I've mentioned. We've, we, we have an intranet. We've only had it since January, so it's still very exciting. Um, but, you know, on there, there is so much um, resources and, and, and help. Um, uh, I'll come back to that later. Actually. Yeah, no problem. Anybody else want to jump in on the getting the message um, out? I, th I think I think it's really really difficult because um, anyone who's a frontline people manager or people leader. I mean, we've got nearly a thousand um, people managers in our business, and and about three years ago, and, and we train them with everything. You know, they've got food safety, they've got quality, they've got health and safety, they've got every other manager training course you can think of, fire safety. And about three or four years ago, we put them through a, a mandatory training on how to have sen sensitive conversations. And if you ask most of them now, so about 700 of our line managers went through that, most will probably say, I don't remember doing it, because it was manager training. They, ha they did it on a Friday afternoon, just as they rushed out of, because they'd got another reminder and another reminder. So mm. I, think, I think there's a real place for... Um, training your frontline people leaders, but I think there's also that how do you weave it into the every other day things that they do so that it doesn't just become about, you know, yes, I've done my training now, I've ticked a box. You know, I did my fire safety training about a month ago. I can't remember what, what I did. Um, I really cared about it. I took a great interest in it, but asked me what, I, what it was all about. I've got no idea, but I know where to go to get out of a fire and how to break the thing on the wall. You're not the fire marshal, are you? Yeah, no, I'm not a fire marshal. Oh, that's good. Oh, <laughs> surprise, dear. surprise. Um, so I think, it's, I think you do have to keep, you have to be really inventive about the way you engage your people leaders, because most of them say to, you know, say, have said, you know, anecdotally is, it, it's okay doing all that training, but I'm still not sure I know how to have that conversation with that individual four or five, six, seven months down the line, because that's when you have it, not when you walk out your training. So what's wrong then? Is it, is it the training? Is it the way it's delivered? Is it, what's the barrier? What stops it? I from think there's a, there's a really big challenge, as you were saying there, on, on, on frontline sort of supervisors and team leaders. I've got so much to do. Yeah. Um, give them more things to do. Mm. And, and it's almost uh, just a, a straw that breaks the camel's back. We, we're, we're really not very good at this bit. Uh -huh. I, I, I drew a simple sort of wedding cake type model of, of trying to get, how do we make sure that every layer of the wedding cake is, is supportive? So that at the bottom of the wedding cake, you've got everybody. So what we're doing to increase everybody's awareness of mental health issues and get them to talk about it. And then the first one above that is supervisors and team leaders. And we've got about, this isn't a game of, I've got more than you, but we've got about <laughs> 2,000. Well, as much as you can. Um, uh, team leaders and supervisors, and it's, you, you can't do a two-day no, training can't. session for 2,000 2, people. You just, you just can't do it. Yeah. So, you, so you try to create through the internet, uh, EDI hubs and whatever else, information. But the challenge is actually getting them to be aware of it, to remember they're aware of it. So look at it, because all I really want from the team leaders and supervisors is when somebody comes to them in distress, for them to go, I recognize this mm. and I know how to help you. I mean, when I was a, a, a few years ago, when I was a, a young manager, I was absolutely awful at it. If I had people come into my office in distress, I would just look out the window because I, I just didn't know what to do. Or worse, I would go, oh, do I need to get the tissues out? I mean, never say that to anybody unless you've got a lot of tissues. <laughs> um, so, so it's a real challenge because the team leaders, supervisors, especially with us, they've probably been promoted from the team. They probably live in the same street 
as half of their team. Yeah. So then to say to them, we want you to do this as well, it's a, it's a really big challenge. And, and they've got to want to do it as well, Absolutely. because if they don't want to do it, they're just going through the, you know, the, the, they're just going through the training because some people aren't quite ready to be that person to have the right conversa mm. to have that conversation. So some of it is just about if you don't feel like you can, where do you signpost them to? So, you know, rather than every line manager has got to be able to, you know, be this, you know, great manager because mm. we know that not all people managers are good people managers. Um, you know, at least if they know where to find the card that says, you know, do you want to go and talk to a mental health first aider? Do you want to go and talk to the EAP? Yeah. So I think that's more yeah. is helpful sometimes than putting everybody through a, a training programme. Because you, you're going to get skill fade, aren't you? I, ideally, this is something you're going to teach them, but you don't want them to have to use that often. Mm. Mm. Um, you want them to be there when, when, when they need it, but you don't, you're not expecting them to have these, need to have these conversations on a daily or weekly basis. It's interesting. So those skills will go... Yeah. And I think you and sit it on the head. At the minimum, you want them to be able to remember how to recognise what they're seeing in front of them and be able to go somewhere to get additional help. I think if they can just remember that bit... Mm. Yeah, I, I would challenge that slightly Did on the you? basis that I think the, the kind of big... You know, some of, the, some of the kind of big life events happen rarely and some of the kind of big distress, distressing things can happen rarely. But actually it's often a kind of undercurrent of relatively minor things that can wear away at someone's well-being. So, and that's why it doesn't, you know, these conversations don't always have to be the kind of get the box of tissues out, sit yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. They really are the sort of, you know, how are you today? Mm, that's fair. How are things now? Not, not kind of, are you okay? And yeah, yeah, thanks, move on. <laughs> but actually knowing, you know, other people have said it um, on this stage earlier today, kind of knowing your people and being able to pick up those differences in perhaps, well, if it might be obvious from their mood, it might be obvious from, from, from how they're working, the, the quality of their work, the amount of it, the time of day or night they're doing it, all of those things. Someone keeps saying, actually, I haven't slept well, I haven't slept well. After a week of this, you know, there's something up. Mm. Um, and so I think it is just being a little bit attuned to mm. um, the, the importance of those perhaps almost everyday conversations in your it, role. It strikes me as being more proactive than reactive. Mm. Um, mm. We've heard a lot about EAPs, we've heard or employee assistance programs, we've heard a lot about allies and mental health first aiders, and people will tend to seek out these resources or be signposted that way when crisis hits, when we've hit rock bottom. But what are we doing before that piece? I suppose that's where the training piece comes in, the education, the information, creating a common vocabulary across the board. So I'm going to try and nail you down to this now. Can you come up with two key takeaways that our audience can take away? There are, if we have time, I'd like to come to one, one or two of these questions here. But some key things that you've learned in your, journey about, in your journey about embedding this approach on the individual and this holistic approach to well-being and mental health rather than just following KPIs. Any thoughts? Do you, uh, I'm going to go first. Go on then. Because then I don't, have to think of someone else. I don't want to go last. <laughs> then, you should have spoken up. Don't you worry, Jim. <laughs> two, two, two simple things. It's got to start from the top. Okay. I think, um, I, I think when we had a telephone call about this, I, I used the phrase, uh, I came out as, as somebody who suffered from mental health uh, issues uh, by mistake in a, in a video to the workforce, which was just supposed to be advertising uh, Mental Health Day that year. Um, so it's got to start from the top. Um, because, like it or not, people look at their leaders and uh, actually kind of observe you. Uh, so that's the first one. And the second one, which you all hate me for, is you've got to communicate and you've got to over-communicate and you've got to make sure that communication stays uh, current and vibrant, but, but in people's minds. Mm. Brilliant, thank you. Let's go to June so she's not last. Come on. I oh, know, I don't mind. Um, I think two things for me. Um, be prepared to go slow. Um, culture change takes a long, long time. We launched our wellbeing strategy back in 2013, and if you'd have told me it would take me until last year to get something like mental health first aiders in, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, but it's taken all that time to actually bring the, the business along with me. So really, really um, take it slow and know your business. Um, you know, really know your business inside out because that what works in one place won't work in another, otherwise you impose things into, um, into you know, different functions, that, that will just crash and burn. So know your business and really be prepared to have a little bit of patience. Thank you, June. Mm -hmm. Ben? 
Um, I suppose the two things for me would be uh, go back to stuff you know as managers and leaders. You, as, as a manager and leader, you've probably done training courses in change management, change leadership, those sort of things. Go back to that stuff you know and use the techniques. Um, the content may be different and feel a bit scarier because it's around people and mental health, but actually the techniques you need to change culture in a business over a very long time are pretty much the same stuff. So over-communicate, get buy-in from the top, look for quick wins, you know, get your books out for Cotter and Cotter. Go, go through all that stuff. <laughs> it really is worth it because it takes some of that fear out of yeah. it. This is stuff I know. This is stuff I've done before. It's div the, the content's different and, 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 and it's much more personal maybe, but actually it will give you some really good techniques to go back to to try and manage through that process. Um, and the other thing, just like any other change program, resources. It's all very well uh, having the, the buying from the top and all that sort of thing, but unless you, you're going to be able to commit people's time to this, yeah. you're not going to get anywhere. Again, like any change program, anybody in this room has probably led and tried to run. If you try and end up doing it one hour a week with just you, you're not going to change very much. You need to get commitments, the proper resources you need to change the organisation. I like what you said there in, in relation to, is this another thing that we're adding to managers' workload? Well, no. If, if the job of a manager is to get the best out of their people, this is another conversation, another way yeah. in to be able to perhaps do that ultimately. So I, I, I like that, yeah. What about you, Joan? Yeah, I think kind of building on that and <clears throat> at the risk of sounding slightly um, trite, this is everybody's business. Yeah. I really think this is everybody's business, and and that means that every everyone, all of us, can go. You know, you can go back into work tomorrow and talk about having been here. What did you do? How, how was you? What did you do? Yesterday, I was at a conference called "This Can Happen," and this is what it was about. And actually, just you know, find people who are willing to engage in that conversation with you. They can be anybody. It helps if their leaders and their voices are louder. But anyone in your business, if, they, if they're interested and they have a passion for this, they can be leaders of this themselves. And so sometimes it doesn't take as much resource, especially, as I said, I know I'm in a small company, as, as you think it may be. It takes kind of human resource. It, it takes people to champion it um, and to be willing, really, also, I, I believe, to share, to share their own stories. Um, it's one thing that I think we had a bit of a sea change um, earlier this year at Simply Business, where during Mental Health Awareness Week, we got together. There was a small group of us who kind of, you know, championed these things and, and thought, what if we shared some of our stories on our mental health um, page on, on our intranet? And at first we thought, well, no one's really going to do it. There were five of us around the table. I said, okay, well, the five of us will go first and we'll see what happens. And as the week went on, it just snowballed. Um, and there were people by Friday adding their stories, either anonymously or with their names on, saying, I would never, if you asked me at the beginning of this week, I thought I'd never do this, but I've had the courage now seeing, actually, I'm not alone, and this is more common than I thought, and there's, there's plenty of other people out there going through something similar. They were willing to do it, and what that does is it starts to normalise the conversations so that, you know, if you see someone with a, a broken arm or something visibly wrong with them, you'll say, oh, how did that happen? Are you okay? You know, you'll, you'll exchange some stories. If you see somebody who's just not looking well in themselves, you might, in that environment, be able to say, you're actually all right. Yeah. Whereas before you might not. Yeah. Before you may have taken them down capability proceedings. Yeah, so, so one is, it's everybody's business, and two is, go first. If you can talk, you'll open it up for others. You don't need a certificate for that, do you? I suppose. You don't need a certificate you know? for that. Um, it, it's really interesting, ladies and gents. As we sort of bring this to a close, I've got about a minute left, but I know there's a couple of questions that we didn't get to, and I, I am sorry about that. But I want to take you back to where we started um, this session when I asked you to stand up and sit down. Did you know that in 2019, the CIPD found in a survey that 83% of respondents said that they work when they are unwell? 83%. I think what we saw in the room mirrors that, to be honest with you. The second question I asked you was about, have you ever worked when you're on the sick? 67% admitted to doing the same. So we may have ticked the absentee box. We may have got the ally, the first aid, uh, the policy. But I suppose we've spoken quite a lot about culture change. Who are the ones best placed to change culture? Well, think about the local teams. Think small. Yes, it can come from the top with backing. You've got a wonderful phrase. Do you want to say it? Go on, hit them with it. Um, so, <laughs> Quick. simple phrase. Uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> executive sponsored, HR supported, but employee led. Whoa. So we'll try to get it to. I've I love that. Good then. ideas. So. Say that again, they're writing it down. <laughs> executive sponsored, 
HR supported and employee led. Got it. Gold, isn't it? Yeah. That's copyrighted, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so about embedding, we're talking about the bonfire burning in the background here, not just the fireworks of the mental health awareness events and campaigns that go on there. I hope you'll uh, join me in thanking our panel for sharing so openly. Thank you. There is... Uh, is this still on? That's my microphone still on. There is just one thing I just wanted to say as we close and I hand over. Flashing. I know it's flashing. It's okay. It's five seconds. <laughs> just saying you care and having a policy and having a plaque somewhere doesn't mean that you do. It's just a thought. Just to consider that. You know, don't wait for permission from the top. It's much easier to ask for forgiveness. Set something up and run with it. Thank you very much, Emily. Take care. Thank you.